a lot of the new data suggests that if toxins are introduced through that broken scalp before they're introduced through natural ways, so for food, for example, through the gut, if they're introduced through the skin, those proteins are hitting the skin, then it triggers your immune system in a way. It goes to the Th2 pathway to become more atopic and fight those proteins like they're a danger. What we're now becoming much more aware of is the importance of that microbiome on the skin and the scalp because if you can keep it balanced and keep that skin barrier protected, it may decrease that whole atopic march, meaning eczema to environmental allergies to food allergies to asthma. Dr. Gupta, I'm so excited to have you back on the show so that we can talk about this whole scalp inflammation issue that drives people crazy with flakes all over their clothes, cradle cap and kids. Uh, Thank you so much for being here and coming back. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much for having me back. I love, love this. So I appreciate you. Well, the reason that I wanted to have this conversation with you is um, I think I learned from you back at the food allergy conference where we met about Mm. this whole line that you and actually Dr. Peter Leo helped to work on and create called Yobi. And, And I found it so fascinating because... It is hard when you're dealing with scalp issues, the itch, the, I mean, I get emails from people who have such incredible, immense personal embarrassment who, you know, have to wear dark suits or dark shirts. And like, they are constantly having to brush themselves off, worried people are going to see this. It's in their hair. You have other people who have scalp inflammation, really itchy scalps. And then oh, the kids, like where it's hard and even into babies where their scalp is just so uncomfortable. So would you mind sharing what inspired you to care about this and, and do research around it? Yes. Oh, of course, Jennifer. So I am, um, I'm a pediatrician. I run a research lab, you know, that studies the atopic march and, um, you know, as fate would have it, my daughter was born uh, with severe eczema and um, terrible cradle cap. And this is now, she's 18. So this is a long, long time ago. So when um, she was born, you know, I realized, you know, there were very few treatments other than steroids. Yeah, so I was lathering her with steroids. I was putting um, steroid um, oil in her scalp, you know, and um, that is all I had. And she was really miserable. And so, you know, being a researcher um, who studies eczema, I I was like, this is ridiculous. There's got to be something better. So we went on a quest and um, my daughter, Rhea, became my guinea pig and we would try all kinds of things on her because um, there had to be a better way. And so fortunately, we did find a group of ingredients that worked really well for her. In fact, um, it stabilized her. And again, this is 17 years ago now. Um, and what we know now is we were balancing her microbiome instead of stripping it and using steroids to constantly, um, you know, temporarily relieve it. Uh, we were able to rebalance and put good stuff back in and make it healthier climate, you know, for her scalp and her skin. And that, um, really changed our worlds. Uh, she was so much better, so much more comfortable, and we weren't lathering her with chemicals. So um, when that happened, and so some of those ingredients were things like honey, which we all know is such a natural anti-inflammatory, probiotics, of course, the whole microbiome piece, um, and then you know healthy other anti-inflammatories like turmeric, and then Peter's like, you have to have B12. So <laughs> you know we put that in there of too. So um, this combination of ingredients works so well in her. What happened next is being a physician researcher, I just started giving it to my patients in clinic. And um, Peter did, and we would mix some, you know, in the lab and um, hand it out. And this actually went on for 10 years. Wow. <laughs> and it, it spread. Then other clinics would use it. We would pass it out, other attendings, because I work in the Northwestern Lurie hospital system. And then um, finally, Northwestern heard about it and they're like, hey, if you have something good, um, (laughs) why don't you share it with the world? And uh, that's when about five years ago, you know, we 
uh, with their support, with Northwestern support, we um, patented it. We did some studies because as we know, you know, being in the medical field, you got to prove it, you know, through research. And so we did a study in kids and a study in adults, and we found that it significantly reduced uh, dryness, dandruff, itching, inflammation. Um, and then we went full force ahead and we released last November. So it hasn't been that long, almost a year. Oh my gosh. Um, but we have a scalp mask, which was the original product that we used um, for my daughter. And then, you know, people wanted a shampoo and conditioner to go along with it. So we created those and then people were using it on their skin. So we created, you know, just a cream. So that's, that's it. That's our whole, whole awesome. product line, but it's super exciting. This episode is brought to you by my skincare line, Dermaquel. The beauty of these skincare products are that they are especially crafted for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues based on my research and clinical experience from my private practice. They focus on organic ingredients that are clean like zinc, aloe, and hemp oil that support and calm rashed, dry, angry skin. There's no unnecessary chemicals or additives that can further dry out your skin or mess with your hormones. And I'm so excited for you to add these creams into your routine. Check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. Well, so uh, you mentioned a couple of things. Um, I think parents especially or parents to be would be a little curious. Did, could you define what exactly cradle cap is just so everybody knows what we're kind of talking about on the same page? Because that is and that is mostly in children, correct? That doesn't happen in adults. No, no. Um, so, you know, when uh, babies are born, you know, their, their whole microbiome is changing. Uh, they get their microbiome mainly from from their mom, and then obviously other factors, the environment, um, other toxins, if they were given antibiotics, everything influences them, right? And influences your microbiome in general. And we're learning more and more about that every single day. Um, so cradle cap usually happens in infants, usually starts pretty early. Um, they get almost like psoriasis flakes, you know, like yellow flaky um, uh, things in their scalp. And it is it's, it's bothersome. Um, some infants it irritates and like my daughter would really want to, you know, scratch and, and be very irritated. But a lot of times, um, it's more bothersome to the parents because, you know, they've got all these plaques in their scalp and, um, and then it gets oily and, and irritable. So, uh, and sometimes red. And so those are natural symptoms and it's, it's just because of the microbiome that is occurring on their scalp at that point in time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but cradle cap typically, you know, the first thing you do is use some oil and a comb and try to just take out those, um, uh, areas, those, uh, flaky areas. And, um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know, oftentimes as infants get older, it will naturally improve, you know, but, but parents are trying all kinds of things. And then a lot of times, um, pediatricians don't have any other options. They'll use kind of those adult head and shoulder or Salsen blue or some of those shampoos, or they'll use, um, kind of oily steroids like Dermasmooth. So those are those are common treatments for it. Um, the interesting thing about cradle cap and what we're learning more and more is, you know, a lot of these infants with cradle cap also have eczema. And so it's this whole pattern that's starting with this um, atopic march. And, you know, what we're learning more and more is, you know, broken skin or, or broken scalp, you know, when you have that irritation and inflammation, um, a lot of the new data suggests that if toxins are introduced through the skin, through that broken skin, through that broken scalp, um, before they're introduced through natural ways, so for food, for example, through the gut, if they're introduced through the skin, those proteins um, are hitting the skin. I did this. I was a mom. I was I was nursing my daughter, and I was eating nuts, right? Because they're so healthy, and you need to snack and and stay. 
um, fed when you're, you know, in that busy, busy state of your life. So, you know, eating nuts and having an exemitous daughter and, and all of that protein falling into her skin, you know, is and her scalp, you know, at that time. I didn't even realize it. We didn't know these things. You know, this was, again, 18 years ago. So what we've learned now is then it um, triggers your immune system in a way. It goes to the Th2 pathway to become more atopic and fight those uh, proteins like they're a danger. You know, so what we're now becoming much more aware of is the importance of that microbiome on the skin and the scalp, because if you can keep it balanced and keep that skin barrier protected, um, it may decrease that whole atopic march, meaning eczema to environmental allergies, to food allergies, to asthma. So that's what's really exciting. Uh, the more and more we learn about it, the, um, the better it gets for people because yeah. Uh, we have an opportunity here to make a real impact and prevent disease. Yeah. And, and so just to be clear, it does sound like in children, young children and babies, typically, um, I know when uh, Dr. Leo's been on the show yeah. and I've talked to him, he was always like, well, think about the cheeks, the cheeks and kids, <laughs> like they're smearing food all over and this is potentially yeah. introduction. But I guess I didn't think about the scalp, I mean, it's close. Like you said, you could end up getting food particles on this delicate area as well. So, yeah. so that reaction, it doesn't necessarily matter what part of the skin could be exposed to, let's just pretend it's a food protein that this poor little child has not yet had introduced orally. Any area, including the scalp, could be a potential entry point, but it's like, it's sort of like sneaking into a concert. <laughs> you know, you found a door in the side of the building and you're really not supposed to be in there, but that's how you got in. That's sort of like how I'm thinking about this reaction that happens in these kids where they then develop, like your daughter, correct? She has a food, an actual food allergy. Yeah, she does. She went on to develop, so she had eczema cradle cap and then went on to develop food allergies. And, you know, of course, as like I said, fate would have it. That's everything I study. But I love that, Jennifer. I love what you just said, because now it's like the image is, is mm -hmm. so strong. Like, so you're sneaking in, but then security runs. Yep. And, and tries to get you out and protect the concert. Right. right. And, so, and that's exactly what's <laughs> happening because then your immune system's like, wait, 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 what's this, you know, mm. coming in the back door and we need to, to get rid of it and protect the body when it's really not an invader, you know, you just couldn't get a ticket and you're going to be perfectly fine <laughs> hanging out and listening to the music. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you if didn't you know where the right door was. <laughs> exactly. Or you're like, well, I didn't quite have, they, they were sold out. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I do think that that's an important point to make. I, I think, you know, the one factor that's really fascinating that I love about this is like, I focus a lot on the gut microbiome in my practice. Mm. And obviously we, we are learning constantly this interplay interplay between like the gut and the skin and the gut and the brain and all of mm. these different areas that are so important. But one thing you said initially and even before we started was how the scalp microbiome there is a microbiome there but it seems to have lagged yes like we've looked at other skin microbiomes but i i even tried pulling research before this and the scalp microbiome really doesn't which is interesting because we have hair it's such an important part <laughs> of our body but it it does feel like it has been ignored a little bit I agree. I, you know, as I, you know, started developing Yobi, I was trying to do research and we're, you know, studying the scalp microbiome and, and all um, the people, the wonderful participants in our trials, we've done pre and post scalp swabs and even like collecting the microbiome is more challenging because of the hair and everything, but it is different. So you're exactly right. I feel like we know the most about the gut right? The gut microbiome. And we still, there's so much more to know, right? Like what is a healthy gut? And But people have understood probiotics and keeping their gut healthy. And, and that's a very 
well-known thing now in society. But when you start and then skin, you know, like, oh, well, what about the skin? Oh, well, there is trillions of bacteria and microorganisms all across your skin and scalp, you know, and, and what are those? And what is a healthy microbiome for the skin? And then you get to the scalp, like you said, and you're like, oh my gosh, what's this healthy scalp microbiome? Because, you know, our hair is so important to us. And, and how do you keep your hair and have good hair growth? Good, healthy scalp, you know, but we don't discuss this. And, and it is something that is now, you know, becoming more interesting. And so um, what's so fascinating about the scalp is it is part of the whole skin, you know, this whole largest organ system that we have, but, um, or protective organ system, but um, it's different, right? So you have uh, a different bacteria um, and fungus, right? All the, the fungi yeast that we talk about that um, cause that dandruff and irritation. So um, Yobi, when we, when we developed it for babies and we started using it in adults and it really supported adults too, because in the end, all you want is a stable microbiome, you know, that is healthy. And how do you get there? So for the scalp, usually what happens on the scalp is um, you have, we're learning all the different bacteria that are good and bad, but we know about them, you know, malaysia, right? Like that is the one that if it's overgrowing, then you have issues. And so how do you keep it under control? So for the scalp, I mean, typically your cells should um, regenerate every month. And what happens when you have dandruff, it, it's happening more frequently. And that's where you're getting those white flakes. So it's happening almost weekly, you know, and, and what's causing that? So many things. So, um, you know, we all use different hair products now. And a lot of the hair products have chemicals in it. And so what are those chemicals doing to disrupt the microbiome? And so, you know, you have to think about that. Other big factors for the scalp, and we all know this, because when you travel from, you know, the Northeast to, you know, Florida, your hair poofs out, <laughs> all the humidity. And, you know, what is the humidity and the environmental conditions and pollution do to our scalp and our hair? And we, I feel like everyone notices it in their hair. You know, that's like the most common way, but, um, how do you balance that in your scalp to give yourself healthier hair? So, you know, what I would say in terms of scalp microbiome that we're learning is that, you know, dandruff occurs when you've got that frequent turnover. Um, and we know a lot about malaysia now and how do you keep that under control? And a lot of these, um, anti-dandruff shampoos have antifungals, you know, they're, they're killing it off and, but killing it off, it'll just come right back. You know, so that's not just continuously killing something is not a solution for keeping your scalp healthy and, um, actually doing it in a more natural way. Yeah. And so I think that was our goal with Yovi is how do we put anti-inflammatories like, like honey and turmeric, you know, and help them support it. And those are more of the pre- biotics, you know, and then add in healthy bacteria to, you know, replenish your bacteria and then, um, no chemicals, right. Not adding in other harmful chemicals, harmful fragrance, harmful allergens that could also then cause that disruption. And so honestly, you know, the Yobi product line, although it helps with dryness, it's good for any scalp types, because all it's doing is giving you that healthy environment. Well, it's also interesting because I was, like I said, I was trying to look up, I was like, let me, let me get prepared for this conversation. And as I said, it's really hard to find much information on the scalp. I know that interestingly, if like you look at other parts of the body, there's also like a bit of a kind of microbiome and follicles and, and like, especially with acne, it's like, I don't, there's just so much stuff. We're always learning. It's so fascinating. Um, but a couple of things that I found, like one said that like in seborrheic dermatitis, there's higher, um, uh, staph epidermidis, of, um, present, uh, which I was like, wait, really? That's interesting. Um, then that there was like interesting ratios that were kind of skewed in the malassezia. Like there's different 
subspecies. And in those different subspecies, some are higher than others versus like when you see dandruff scalps versus healthy scalps. So it's really fascinating. It wasn't what I expected, to be entirely honest with you. Um, So I'll be curious to see more research as it comes out. But it's so cool to know that you and Dr. Leo created this little plan and you did this like kind of like, I don't know, it's cool. It's almost like, you know, how you make stuff in your own kitchen. You're like, oh yeah, this works, this works. You guys like made this in a little lab, you know, together and you tra- you really use it with patients. So the, the thing I want to get at too is that is the ingredient list because I find that and we talked about food allergies and I've had like Dr. Jeff Yu on the show to talk about contact um, dermatitis and contact allergies, but there are a lot of chemicals in shampoo and hairspray and conditioners and all of this stuff, even though they're marketed to us and sometimes the labels look really green, but you can be allergic to chemicals, even if it's in a free, a quote unquote, free and clear formula. So, so can you talk a little bit about that? Since obviously your specialty is, is in more of the allergic side of things and how might, if you were allergic to something in a product that you're using, how could that show up on this, on the scalp? Yeah. Oh my goodness. It, it's so true. And it, it's so frustrating because so many things will look all natural and safe. And then you start reading what's in it, you know? So I would say, be very, very careful. You know, when you try something new, if you have any irritation or you feel something, um, there are, you know, great organizations that, you know, substantiate things that are natural and, and you know, focus on those. Um, don't just, take their word for it, you know, what's on the bottle. Um, but you will see that come up. You, a lot of times you'll have more irritation or itching, you know, like, I think that's one of the first signs you'll feel, um, you can have like visibly redness, but a lot of times with all our hair, you won't be able to see it. So I feel like the first thing that happens is, is itching or your hair won't feel the same, or you'll, you know, feel irritated in some way. And, if that happens, you know, really go back and look at the ingredient list of that product because, you know, most things have something, right? Some kind of fragrance, you could be reacting to the fragrance. Um, you could be reacting a lot of them, you know, and we talk about this so much in food allergy, have have food in the as one of the ingredients. And so you have to be very, very careful about that, especially with those young infants, but for anyone, you know, like what is the food that you're putting on your scalp or your skin? You know, a lot of skin and scalp things have that. So yes, I mean, the allergy piece is so important because they all go together. All of those um, eczema and, you know, the cradle cap and food allergies and allergic rhinitis and asthma, like they're all connected, you know? And so um, if you have one, you have a higher chance of having the rest, right? So those babies with eczema, just like my daughter developed food allergies. Um, But, you know, now we're seeing more and more like a lot of the creams or um, like you said, shampoos will have a food component and that could be causing that food allergy to start up because it's being entering them through their skin. So I I really appreciate you bringing that up because it is very, very important when you try, we talk about it with, um, uh, you know, cleaning supplies too, you know, whatever you use, when you make a change, if you start feeling anything, you know, whether it be rashes or redness or itching or irritation, um, take another look at that and talk to your doctor or look it up, you know, and really understand what those ingredients are. And I I think it'll be helpful too for maybe adults who either have food allergies or who have kids right now who have food allergies. So what I hear you saying is that if you have a food allergy, like you know it, you've been diagnosed with it, especially I would assume if it's life threatening, yes. you, sh- you should not should, I mean, what's your thoughts? Should you use a topical and topical? I mean, anything that you're applying to your skin that contains 
that ingredient. Like for example, I, I interviewed Dr. Stacy Silvers. He talked about dairy allergies and we like went really in the weeds about dairy. And he was just like, yeah, I probably, if you have a dairy allergy, like a legit IgE dairy allergy, I would not use products even with goat milk in them. So what's your thoughts on that for someone who has a diagnosed allergy? Do they need to be careful with shampoos and conditioners and moisturizers and such that may be more natural and could potentially have a food-based ingredient profile uh, that is found in that product? 100%. Yes. I mean, if you have a true IgE-mediated food allergy and any of that food that you're allergic to comes in contact with your skin, you develop a rash. You know, there it, it's, you know, contact in that food, your skin reacts, you know, and that's what, you know, when you do skin prick tests, you know, and um, so... It is very, very important if you have a food allergy that you know about to avoid um, any products with those foods in them, 100%. But, you know, I'm really excited. I mean, of course, I would love the world to all use EOB <laughs> from babies yeah. up to the elderly. It's safe and effective for everyone. But what's so exciting is you have options, right? Mm -hmm. There are many, many more natural products, your products. You know, like there's so <laughs> many incredible new products that yeah. are really safe and natural. So when you have choices, take them. Don't go for the big brands that, you know, smell really good because it's, you know, like a fragrance, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, being very vigilant um, will keep you healthier. And honestly, I really do believe, and and I know more and more literature is coming this way, but we just use too many cleansers, right? We're, we're like constantly soaping up and shampooing and it is you know, if you can get healthier ones that don't have as many of those harsh cleansers, because those cleansers are, are stripping your microbiome every time you use it. So how often do we have to use them? And are there are better options? And, you know, definitely no antibacterials. Like those drive me crazy. <laughs> like you are literally killing off the bacteria and it's not just bad bacteria. We have so much good bacteria that we know about. And so being very, very careful, I think, you know, the pendulum kind of swung, you know, we had all these diseases and we swung it to the other side. We we're like, oh my gosh, we have to be super clean, but then there's consequences with that too. So we need to get kind of in that middle zone where we are clean, but we're not using all those harsh chemicals and antibacterials. Yeah. So I know that I'll have people asking these questions. So I figured I'd ask you just in yeah. case somebody's like, was Yobi right for me? So who can use this product? Can we use it also on babies and women who say are pregnant? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's what we're so excited about. I mean, you can use it on babies, um, kids, adults, and, you know, you can use the same one. You know, we have, I'm going to have it right here. I mean, we've got, we've got Yobi and we've got, um, baby kids and adults, but honestly, I'll be honest. I mean, everyone can use baby. If you get the baby, use it for yourself, you know, and what's so great about it, it's a scalp mask. It's really thick. Um, wash it off. I mean, it does have honey in it. So just be careful. Baby shouldn't consume it, you know, but, um, it is, uh, you know, just like steroids, baby should not eat the steroids <laughs> that you're putting on them. So, um, but, you know, it's thick, rinse, you know, put it in on your baby's scalp, especially if they have cradle cap, even if they don't, it's healthy for them. Um, and then just leave it in for a couple minutes and rinse it out, you know, and okay. that's it. And for adults, you know, what I do is I use the scalp mask. I um, wash my hair every day. It's just a habit. But now I use the scalp mask every other day. And I just put a little in my hand, mix it with some water, massage it in and rinse it out. And scalp feels great. And I didn't put a cleanser in, but it feels clean, you know, and then, you know, obviously we have the shampoo and conditioner and then you can, you can use these. And I really love, you know, a scalp massager. We, we have it, um, with it, but like just massaging your scalp and opening it up, you know, is, is really good for your scalp as well. So, you know, those are, it's kind of the, the way to do it. So the scalp mask alone, you don't need anything else for babies. You don't need shampoos. You don't need conditioners, just the scalp mask. For adults, you could do the scalp mask alone too. Um, if you really want a shampoo or a conditioner, you know, alternate it or do the scalp mask like you do a face mask every weekend, you know, just add it in. And um, so you, I feel like people get their own routines and what works, but honestly, 
a lot of guys especially and me um scalp mask alone it's like your shampoo conditioner in one but it's so healthy for your scalp could i also ask just because i mean my husband has had mm-hmm. issues with um beard druff right oh, so he, goodness, so yes. could you also use that on the beard or in the eyebrows if you have some issues there oh yes thank you so much so many men have been using it on their beards and with so much success. Yes, uh, it is. I, you know, everyone's like, you can, I, we, we have people saying it and then guys are like, well, can you make a beard care? <laughs> and I'm like, you mean put the same stuff in a jar and just call it beard care? <laughs> just, just get it. I not like, I don't want to sell more, but the same thing is going to work on yeah. everyone in your family and your beard and your scalp. So okay. it's just the only product you need. So absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And then I figured the one last question that anybody who colors their hair, and I know you oh. have to be really careful because obviously some shampoos will strip the hair, the color and cause issues. So is this safe for color hair that is colored? Yes. Oh, not only is it safe, it's good for hair that's colored. Um, you know, we're in um, some salons, we're getting in more salons and spas, along with the derm offices like Peter's and allergy offices and Pete's offices, but um, they use Yobi scalp mask after every color treatment um, because you're you're adding chemicals to your scalp when you color your hair and this is helping replenish it immediately. So not only is it safe for colored hair, it's good for colored hair. And then using it on a regular basis will also help not only keep your color and keep your scalp stable, um, but you know be healthy for you. Awesome. So, yes. I'm glad to know that we have all these options. Um, You guys do have a website. It's yobicare.com. And I'll certainly put that links in the show notes as well as your amazing book, which we talked about the last time, Food Without Fear. Um, Especially, that's great if you have food allergies, your kids have food allergies, so to better really understand especially anaphylactic food allergies. Um, I thought that is just such an amazing resource for people. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll link up where everybody can find this. And I just so deeply appreciate you sharing about these, this amazing line that you, you and Dr. Leo helped bring to life. And um, I really, truly hope that it'll be helpful for listeners out there who are struggling with this, especially because it's something more natural and something that they know has actually been used in practice for a long time that got people results. Oh, yes. I I mean, and that is our only intention. You know, how I think we share that vision, Jennifer, is like, how do you get better, safer, more mm-hmm. natural, science-proven products to people? You know, and that's our tagline is lifetime of healthy. And that's what we want from babies to adults, you know, just healthier products. Um, so yes, thank you. And, you know, if you have food allergies also feel free to, um, put our, the CPAR website, we have so many free resources, um, on there for anyone with food allergies, um, from babies to, you know, help with school and policies and, um, just care plans. So, you know, please feel free to, um, use all our, our free resources there too. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And I look forward to hopefully having you back sometime. We always yes. have more to talk about, Dr. Gupta. Oh my goodness, always. Yeah, see, this is excellent. You're it's so informative. I love your program. It is wonderful. So thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this video, you need to tune in to this video next. Then make sure to hit the subscribe button so you get notified as soon as a new episode drops. I'm excited to see you there and dive deeper with you on your skin healing journey.